if you're having problems with a saltwater tank, there are certain steps you can follow that will help you fix more or less anything that has gone wrong. So today I'll use this neglected tank with a few serious issues to show you the process you should follow to get your own reef tank back on track with very little time, effort and expense. Now this is a 13 and a half gallon nano tank that I set up around six months ago and that I've been neglecting for a few months now. And because of my neglect, it currently looks like a bit of a dumpster fire. Step one then is to inspect the tank closely so we can identify the cause of the problem. And you can see the ugliness here is caused by the mess of green algae covering the glass and rockwork. Now if you can't identify the pest yourself, the best thing to do is take a really good quality photo and post it on a reliable Facebook group and ask for an ID. Here though, there are two pests that look very similar to this, Dinoflagellates aka Dinos and Cyanobacteria aka Purple Slime Algae. Now dinos typically look like stringy brown algae and they produce air bubbles that get wrapped up in snotty bundles just like this. Whereas cyanobacteria looks more like a mat of algae and is usually a deep purple colour. Now here because of the bubbles and the colour of the goop it is possible that this is indeed dinos. But because there's only one or two bubbles not dozens and because the growth pattern is very much mat like my money is on this being cyanobacteria. While cyano is usually purple it can be green instead and in any event you can see tinges of purple colouring on the glass. With the visual inspection complete I can now scrape the glass clean so I can more easily see what's going on in the tank. Doing this of course releases a whole mess of crap into the water column so it's important to remove that if possible and I have a small piece of filter floss in the filter section so as long as all the pumps are turned on most of this mess will end up getting removed. Now to confirm my suspicions that this is in fact cyano, we need to move on to phase two, which is a full suite of tests. The first of which is the most important, salinity. Incorrect salinity is almost certainly the most common cause of problems in a saltwater tank. So even though my problem is likely related to nutrients, I had a quick peek to make sure my salinity was within range. My test came back at 1.024, when it would ideally be 1.025 or 1.026, but 1.024 is a totally acceptable level, so we move on. And next I tested the triumvirate of nitrate, phosphate and alkalinity. Now alkalinity is really bonus territory for this problem, but if this was a problem with corals, I would definitely test alkalinity alongside calcium and magnesium. But nitrate and phosphate are the main areas to focus on with algae type problems like I have in this tank. And in any event, nitrate, phosphate and alkalinity, plus of course salinity, are the main areas you should test most often in any reef tank. And if you have a fear of bad numbers, look away now. The phosphate checker can only read up to 0.9 parts per million and the flashing number indicates that my phosphate levels are above 0.9, which is well over 10 times what I'd like them to be and in fact is the highest phosphate result I've seen in any of my tanks in eight years of reef keeping. And my nitrate level came back at less than one part per million, which is about 10 times lower than I'd like it. Now I should say that I don't really try to aim for a set number with nitrate and phosphates, but when they're completely out of whack like this, something needs to be done. And to complete the picture, my alkalinity was at 6.4 dKH, which is a tiny bit lower than I'd like, but of no real concern. Now the test results confirm that my problem is almost certainly cyanobacteria, not dinoflagellates. Cyano usually takes advantage of low nitrate and high phosphate, which is what I have here. Whereas in my experience, dinos take advantage when both nitrate and phosphate hit zero. So now we know what we're working with, how do we go about fixing it? Well as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, so I start by looking at possible sources of phosphate getting into the tank in the first place. I have had a few fish and snails die since I've set this tank up, so it's entirely possible that that's the primary cause of my high phosphate. But given the phosphate is so high, it's also worth looking at other sources. I know the water I use for topping off evaporation and for weekly water changes is pristine as my TDS meter reads zero parts per million and I've had ICP tests confirm that there are no nasties like nitrate or phosphate getting through. But if you're not filtering your own water, an RODI filter is an excellent investment and will save you hours of pain later down the line trying to fix problems that could simply have been avoided with good quality source water. Now if I fed coral food, especially something high in phosphate like reefroids, I'd stop adding that or at least dial it back. But I don't feed my corals, so the only other area to check is my fish food. I feed around a quarter of a cube of frozen mices per day, almost all of which gets consumed by the fish, but some does go to waste, so I probably could back off feeding a little bit, or I could switch to small amounts of a low phosphate pellet like Ocean 55, 
but I prefer to feed frozen food, so I'm not going to try to change that for now. Now I should also say that some saltwater aquarium rock can leach phosphate, so it's possible that that's the source in my tank. But the main point of this stage in the process is to identify if there's an area you can do something about, like changing your source water or reducing the amount you're feeding your fish and corals. And once you've done that, or the source of the phosphate is something you can't fix, it's time to move on to the pound of cure. And with a saltwater tank, especially a nano tank like this, dilution is the solution to pollution. So step one is a large water change. With such high phosphates and with relatively few corals to worry about, I've gone for a 30% water change with pristine water filtered by my own zero TDS RODI filter. I use this fluval siphon so I can suck up any cyano that's floating around the tank or sticking to the sound bed. And I take the opportunity to replace the filter floss, which has done a sterling job of removing most of the cyano I got into the water column. Now I could try to scrub the remaining cyano off the rock manually, but firstly Mrs. Reevedork caught me trying to pinch her toothbrush, and secondly that's probably a futile exercise until I fix the underlying nutrient imbalance, so for now just trying to dislodge a little more with the new water is good enough. And while water changes are a very effective method of reducing high nutrients in a nano tank, my phosphates are so high that I need to do more. And the best phosphate remover for a tank like this is GFO. My personal preference is NIOS FOSIEX. Now this stuff is much more effective if it tumbles gently in a reactor, but I have no sump on this tank and GFO will still do a job if it's just sat in a media bag. So I plonk a small amount of the stuff in the bag and dangle it beneath the filter sponge. And I also decided to top up my cleanup crew. I started this tank with several snails, but I'm down to only three or four now, plus my workhorse blue tuxedo urchin. Because some of my snails have died, adding more will likely only end in more snail deaths, which will only serve to further increase the phosphate in my tank. So instead, I went for three red leg hermits. They won't eat the cyanobacteria, but they will help clean up uneaten food and detritus that my snails won't eat, and they'll disturb the surface of the rock and sand bed, all of which will help keep the tank fresh and clean. And as a Brucey bonus, in my experience, the red leg hermit crabs are less aggressive towards snails than some of the other hermits. I also added one milliliter of liquid nitrate because getting nitrate back up to a normal level is at least as big a priority as getting my phosphate down. The easiest way to increase nitrate in most tanks is to reduce the amount of filtration you have. For example, you could disconnect your automatic filter roller or reduce the number of hours your refugium is running. But in this tank, my only filtration is the filter sponge, which I don't want to remove considering all the gunk it's pulling out. I tested my parameters again the next day, and despite all of that, my phosphates are still reading over 0.9 parts per million. But the good news is that my nitrate was back up to 4.4 parts per million, so balance should be restored over the coming days and weeks, as the GFO brings my phosphate levels down to a more normal level, and I'll be happy with anything around the 0.1 parts per million mark. And for completeness after the water change, my salinity was up from 1.024 to 1.025, and my alkalinity was up from 6.4 to 7.2 dKH, both of which are perfectly acceptable levels, so there's no need for me to do anything else there. Now the problem I had with this tank was never going to be fixed in a day, but these before and after shots show just how much difference a small amount of maintenance has made. I spent less than an hour doing all of this, and while the issue isn't resolved, the tank is now back on the right path. It would be understandable to hit the panic button after getting test results like mine, but that really isn't necessary and will only further upset the balance of your aquarium. I can tell you that this problem will have taken months to manifest and corals will tolerate imperfect water conditions much better than they'll tolerate a swift change, so taking more drastic measures than I've done would do more harm than good. And on that note, it can be tempting to resort to chemical treatments as a first resort to fix problems in a reef tank but it is far better to focus on getting your water chemistry right and committing to a bit of regular maintenance first. On this tank over the next few weeks, I'll test nitrate and phosphate twice a week and I'll keep going with 30% weekly water changes until this is fixed, at which point I'll switch back to 10% per week. And if you're not doing regular water changes, your tank will be at a higher risk of experiencing problems in the first place. The only other step I'll be taking is to add a more powerful powerhead because cyanobacteria really doesn't like strong flow and I don't have particularly strong flow in this tank. But new equipment is rarely the answer to a problem in a reef tank, and the key takeaway here is that water quality is king, and maintenance is queen. Now I'd expect this tank to look much better in the coming months, so if you want to see how it turns out, and what I do with it when I've turned it around, make sure you like and subscribe, and until next time, happy reefing.